I would like to invite to the stage Professor Maarten de Rijker. Give him a big hand. So, Maarten, um, I'm just a simple recruiter, and, and I thought mixed initiative search. W what is mixed initiative search? A mixed initiative is when the uh, search engine begins to take over, not just give, uh, giving you answers, right. but also asking you questions and maybe uh, answering your next question for you before you've asked it. So basically, my system saying to me, hey, boss, you're a lazy recruiter. Why didn't you introduce that candidate yet to that job vacancy? It might be a bit more friendly than that, <laughs> but, uh, but yes. Mm, interesting. Um, and w what is the thing that you want people to remember from your talk today? What's, what's the essential element, you think? that, that uh, yeah, some of these complex tasks that we use uh, search engines for to support, right. that some of these complex tasks are being taken over by search engines or will be taken over. Mm. Because yeah, we, we can observe them at scale, and if we can observe, observe something at scale, then we see patterns, machines can learn from this, and they might actually become better than humans mm. and, and some of these activities. Interesting. Looking forward to your talk. Thank Martin you. Reiken. Right, so uh, thanks for the, for the invitation, for the interaction, and uh, th congratulations to TaxKernel and th their success, both, uh, you know, until now and today here with this event. It's a great event. Uh, so I'd like to acknowledge um, some people uh, that have helped me uh, with the work that I'll be presenting, uh, past and present students and postdocs. So this should not uh, come as a surprise to you guys, uh, entities, thinking about entities. Um, objects, groups of objects, relations between them, um, uh, organizations of them, uh, lots of facets, lots of aspects of them. They play an organizing role, not just uh, for the sort of work th that you uh, do, but also uh, in general life, uh, in our cognition. Uh, when we go to search, uh, in, in web search, for instance, we know that uh, close to three quarters of, of queries somehow revolve around entities. If we go to special niches, uh, I don't have any number for, for recruiting, but for, for academic search, uh, over 90% of the queries somehow have to do with entities. So authors, uh, schools, journals, conferences, um, they play an incredibly important role. And uh, search engines have responded to this by not just returning a ranked list of documents, but rank list of, of these entities. You know, when you look for people, you want a list of people. And when you look for organizations, you want a, the organizations. Um, just to remind you of uh, what this looks like, um, so here, uh, here's a query for uh, an entity that um, most of you uh, are familiar with. And so the, the search engine might uh, return a page like this. Um, there's a lot of stuff because there might be lots of reasons why someone would be submitting uh, that query, uh, that particular entity. What does it mean, a lot of stuff? Possible intents, possible things or tasks that you'd like to do uh, with the results uh, for your query. So here we see some background information. That's a, that's a definition, uh, a bit more background information, uh, Wikipedia, uh, a company, uh, mothers, uh, there, there's a, a music band, Mothers, there's a bit of structured information there. The, a music band has uh, songs, has albums. Um, if we scroll down the list, we see uh, news. Mothers are in the news. Uh, there's visual material, obviously. Uh, mothers are on Facebook, obviously. And uh, there are restaurants that are somehow related to them. So what do we see here? It's a, an entity-oriented query, and it has many possible uh, intents, many possible goals that searches might have. And the search engine is, tr is trying to serve all of these in a fairly complex result page. Um, by the way, this was me searching, so this was Google, with, uh, which I've been using for uh, years, so it knows all about me, so these are personalized results for me. It's up to you to infer what this search page um, reveals about me. Anyway, where are we now with, with searching uh, for entities? Um, so we, we were able to recognize them reliably in queries, in documents, um, and we're trying to uh, develop an algorithmic understanding of them um, uh, by trying to understand which words are typically associated with which entity, which facets might, might play a role. 
uh, what entities are associated with a given entity of interest, what organizations, how, how they're all related, etc. And now, you know, ongoing research uh, revolves around this. So discovering these aspects, how do you discover aspects of entities? Uh, for instance, the sort of aspects that might end up in, a, in an entity pane, like here on the right-hand side. Um, well, it turns out that logs are an incredibly informative source uh, for this. So you can find out what facets matter, what aspects matter, by looking at the sort of queries uh, in which these entities occur. You use them to, to, to adapt your display, to, to, to populate your knowledge graph, um, to also influence the ranking. Uh, entity relations, that's another one uh, where there's a, a lot of ongoing work. Uh, why is that? Well, here's, here's the same entity pane again, and we see our entity of interest, Christian Bale, at the top, and we see uh, some facets listed in the text, uh, date of birth, children, etc. And then we see a, a bunch of additional entities, uh, movies, uh, other people, but we don't, we're not told what these additional entities are and why they're mentioned here. Uh, so what you'd like to have is some sort of explanation in your uh, presentation. Uh, how do we get those? Well, typically not by having people manually enter all of these explanations, but by learning them, learning them from text. Uh, because if entities co-occur like this, then someone must have talked about them in, in a given context. And if you see this at scale, you're actually able to, to very reliably um, mine good snippets of text like we have at the bottom here. If you're interested in the relation between Christian Bale and uh, Christopher Nolan, then you will discover a fact like uh, what we have here. So that we've solved last year. Now the next step is uh, mine large volumes of text if you can't really find a good snippet, compose a snippet, generate one if it's not out there written by someone. That's ongoing work. Uh, another bit of, of recent work uh, has to do with entity updates. So many of the really interesting entities are, uh, are highly dynamic. New information comes around for them uh, nonstop, uh, especially newly emerging entities. Uh, you might not have a lot of information about them in your index, in your search engine. Um, what do you do? Well, each time you see it in, in content that's being produced, whether that's news, social media, query volume, try and pick this up. Try and understand what matters about this and try and use this uh, to describe those entities, index those entities with this stream of information and continuously update your index, continuously um, change the ranking based on what you insert uh, in your um, index. Now, what, what matters here? You don't know. You don't have time to have people label this. And if you're mining constantly from new social media query streams, uh, there's going to be a lot of good stuff. There's also going to be a lot of not so good stuff. What do you do? Well, if people care about these entities, there will be people looking for them. Uh, let them decide. How do you let them decide? Look at the click behavior. Look at the interaction behavior. And that actually turns out to work incredibly well. Uh, and if you do this, this continuously having a search engine pick up new information, uh, index it, and then expose it to find out whether it's interesting, uh, your scores go up uh, according to this plot. We heard this morning a talk about uh, deep learning. We've heard several talks about deep learning. Now. There's something interesting that you can do uh, with deep learning and, uh, and entities. Learn representations of these entities. Somehow map them in a semantic space so that entities that are semantically close to each other, that have some sort of meaningful re relationship to each other, are mapped together in this space. But not only that, you can also map in that same space words. What does that mean? In a sense, you're mapping in one space words that describe an entity, that profile an entity, entities that characterize entities. So with this sort of uh, representations, what can you do? Uh, very efficient similar entity finding. I have an entity, give me similar entities. A very efficient expert finding. Here's a topic, 
who are the crucial entities, um, and very efficient entity profiling. Here's the entity. What is the sort of text that's represented in the neighborhood of this entity? Now, what you see here on these plots is um, outcomes of very large-scale or reasonably large-scale uh, experiments uh, on Amazon data. So here the entities were products, Amazon data. And uh, a bar up or, uh, uh, means that we beat uh, a non-semantic baseline. A bar down was uh, you know, a non-semantic baseline beat us. And you see a nice distribution, right? For each of these product categories with Amazon, half of the cases we beat the, the non-semantic baseline, half of the cases we lose. What does that mean? In half of the cases, you really need some semantic understanding of these entities. In other cases, word matching is great. Word matching will do. So the next step, of course, after this would be you combine those two. You try to discover, you try to learn which one to use in which cases. Um, so this is where we are. We can fill this page. We can, we're reasonably good at identifying people's intents. We're reasonably good at matching these intents with different verticals, different groupings of search results. Um, what's next? Well, as a search engine, we know a lot about users. For many users, we can simply learn models about what they're going to like next, what is going to satisfy their next information need. We can actually learn when the next action is going to be, how long it will take, uh, either during a session or until the next session. Now, this learning, and that's an important shift, this learning is no longer uh, uh, offline or supervised. It's online, meaning while people are interacting with the search engine. So we observe their behavior, and from this behavior we try to infer, well, this was a good result. This was a good ranking. That's not a good presentation. Uh, and so the picture you should take home is, uh, is this picture. We have uh, the search engine uh, over there. Uh, and we have the user and the user's information needs, in a sense, acting as, um, as the environment in which uh, the search engine has to operate. And what are the actions that this search engine can take? Well, in, uh, traditionally, an action was simply in response to a query, produce a rank list. And what does the environment say, the user? Well, might submit a new query, but might also give implicit feedback, a click, uh, abandonment, a long click, a short click. And you know, we would go through this loop over and over and over again and, and learn um, uh, good rankings. But given the fact that we've got all this information about entities, isn't there something much more interesting that we can do than just uh, you know, learning uh, maybe slightly different um, rankings, um, different placements of these vertical blocks? It is something more interesting we can do. Um, and one of the things that, that's being uh, pursued now is uh, it's great to have a, a, a complex SERP search engine result page like we saw just now. Uh, but in many cases, uh, that's only one step towards someone uh, trying to complete a task, uh, trying to satisfy a complex information need. Um, it's only one step. Can't we bring the search engine's output a bit closer to uh, the completion of that step? Um, and so that brings us to, to this page. Uh, what should a search engine do when it gets the results. Should it simply uh, return a complex uh, SERP? Should it sometimes give a direct answer? Should it take an action? We saw this morning in, 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 the, in the Google demos, in some cases, you want a direct action, right? Uh, in, that, in their case, that meant fire an app, let the app do something and, and re return that. And maybe even do a booking, uh, make a phone call for you, what have you. Do an action. Uh, engage in a conversation. Uh, that could be a clarification question. It could also be uh, trying to make sure that the, the search engine is dead right about your intent. Um, generate a description, not just a rank list of items, but actually an article, uh, a bio, um, a Wikipedia page. 
uh, the timeline, uh, a summary of a whole pile of, uh, of results. So those are some of the things that are now happening, some of the things that are coming your way. And the more complex these types of answers are, uh, the more, in a sense, uh, the search engine is taking activities out of your hands and executing them somewhat or increasingly autonomously. So let me give you uh, one or two examples. Here's an example that's it's ongoing work. All of this is ongoing work. Um, here's an example that we're working on with the National uh, Institute for Sound and Vision, Bild and Geluid. That's our archive for, for TV and radio um, in uh, about 30 kilometers from here. And so here the users are professional users, uh, media professionals. The business of a media professional is um, to generate interesting narratives, interesting stories. And interesting often means there should be something novel, something sparkling, but it should also have the basic facts. Uh, and so there is a certain structure to the way that they generate narratives, to the way that a documentary on TV or a 30-second snippet uh, background material during tonight's news broadcast, what they look like. We can learn this structure by observing these professionals. We can learn this structure, learn templates. And then once we've learned templates, instead of getting search results and, f and filling these complex SERPs with all the verticals, fill the template tell the story, generate the narrative. And so the challenge here is to, to discover the structure of the narrative, but also to make it sufficiently creative. You know, you shouldn't have the same, same structure in a narrative over and over and again. It should be serendipity, it should be surprises. Um, here's another one. This is ongoing work with uh, colleagues at uh, Microsoft Research in, in Cambridge. Um, so here we're talking uh, about uh, recommendation engines, but the next step will be to do the exact same thing for, for, um, for search engines. Um, so what do we do? We have the system occasionally ask questions, right? Uh, we're, we've tried this out with restaurant recommendations. We're working on doing this with, uh, in an academic search, and, uh, search set setting. So people searching for papers. Um, you can think of this almost like the, uh, the 20 questions game, right? You, you might, have, might have heard of this 20 questions game. You, Jakub and I could play this. Jakub has a, an entity in mind, uh, and then I'm allowed 20 questions to, to try and get to that one entity. Uh, uh, is, it, is, is, it, um, is it a human? And then uh, I can get yes or no uh, answers. Or, right? And so you can think of this. This, the search engine playing the same game with you. But now you, you have a vague information need. It's not that you have one particular entity in mind. You have a vague information need. The search engine is trying to get you to the best possible result for this by asking you a few questions. These questions could be uh, of the binary nature that I just asked Jakub. They could be comparative. Do you like this better than that? And you, so you start and then you iterate through this a couple of times. And what we want to do, of course, is get the right results with the minimal number of questions. And if we think we already know the, the next question or know the, know the next answer to the next question because we've seen this user before, then we'll answer it ourselves. So that's where the search engine begins to take over, just like in the previous example. Now, um, what should be clear from this story so far is that if the, if the search engine is taking over more and more, uh, is becoming more and more active rather than just reactive, um, it should discover things. It should explore options. It should not just execute what it has learned before. It should um, explore. Um, we know, of course, a, a couple of uh, ways in which we can run online experiments, in which we can do online discovery through an A-B test. Uh, or we could look at historical data that we've collected with our uh, previous search engine, and maybe there's something we can learn about the, the next version of our search engine. But what's really challenging, interesting, uh, scary here is uh, exploration online uh, by a search engine 
the search engine deciding which test to carry out, uh, the search engine deciding when to stop an experiment. Right? We're all used to A-B tests. Yeah, should we have a pink button or a blue button on the front page of this website? But this is, uh, and that's usually designed by a human. These are A-B tests designed by machines. And these are A-B tests not just about uh, interface elements, but about rankings, about questions, about presentations, about um, diversity of rankings or not. Um, so there's a whole can of worms here, uh, ethics of uh, online experimentation. Um, to be continued. Now, do people buy this? Do people buy it when they are pr presented not just with uh, uh, ranked result lists or complex SERPs like we know, but for instance with automatically generated stories? Um, this has been going on, uh, computational journalism, uh, automatically generating stories from structured data, for instance from data about sports events. This has been growing slowly but steadily in the past couple of years, also automatically generating, say, an annual report for a company based on the, on the tables, um, based on the financial results. So here's some very recent work by, uh, by some uh, German-American colleagues who, uh, who did what? Uh, they subjected uh, 986 subjects uh, and gave them articles. They gave them articles uh, written by a machine and articles written by a human. And they mislabeled them occasionally on purpose. Uh, so a computer-generated article was labeled with, this is uh, human-generated, do you like it? Uh, and then, and vice versa. And of course, there is a bias. People generally prefer uh, the human-generated uh, articles when they know or what they think they know. But if you don't tell them, and this is the big surprise, if you don't tell them, then subjects rated computer-written articles as more credible and higher in journalistic expertise. Wow. But less readable. Okay, so there's still something to solve here, and we're working on it. Um, so what does this mean? Um, apparently, our technology is, is reaching a level where this automatic storytelling of very complex material uh, is good enough, is, be is becoming good enough. So let me go back to this picture uh, where we have uh, the search engine operating in the world, taking actions, seeing how people respond, changing possibly its actions. Now, the thing I, w I want to drive home here is that these actions are changing. It's not just, should we change the ranking a bit? No, should we change the results? Should you, get, should you get an essay and you get a direct answer? Uh, and when? Um, right? So it is taking more and more initiative. Uh, and it's up to you to decide whether you like this. Be because you're the people who are being experimented with. So I'd like to close with this slide of my, uh, my sponsors. Thanks.